Section 31 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. English Costume by Dion Clayton Calthrop. Section 31. James the Second. Reigned four years, 1685 to 1689. Born 1633. Married, 1661, Anne Hyde. 1673, Mary of Modena. THE MEN AND WOMEN In such a short space of time as this reign occupies, it is not possible to show any great difference in the character of the dress, but there is a tendency, shown over the country at large, to discard the earlier beribboned fashions, and to take more seriously to the long coat and waistcoat. There is a tendency, even, to become more buttoned up, to present what I can only call a frock-coat figure. The coat became closer to the body, and was braided across the front in many rows, the ends fringed out and held by buttons. The waistcoat, with the pockets an arm's length down, was cut the same length as the coat. Breeches were more frequently cut tighter, and were buttoned up the side of the leg. The cuffs of the sleeves were wide, and were turned back well over the wrist. Of course the change was gradual, and more men wore the transitional coat than the tight one. By the coat in its changing stages I mean such a coat as this, the short coat of the early Charles the Second period made long, and following the old lines of cut correspondingly loose. The sleeves remained much the same well over the elbow, showing the white shirt full and tied with ribbons. The shoestrings had nearly died out, giving place to a buckle placed on a strap well over the instep. There is a hint of growth in the periwig, and of fewer feathers round the brim of the hat. Indeed, little low hats with broad brims, merely ornamented with a bunch or so of ribbons, began to become fashionable. Swords were carried in broad baldricks, richly ornamented. The waist-clothes of Mr. Pepys would, by now, have grown into broad sashes, with heavily fringed ends, and would be worn round the outside coat. For riding, this appears to have been the fashion, together with small peaked caps, like jockey-caps, and high boots. The ladies of this reign simplified the dress into a gown more tight to the bust, the sleeves more like the men's, the skirt still very full, but not quite so long in the train. Black hoods with or without capes were worn, and wide collars coming over the shoulders again came into fashion. The pinner, noticed by Pepys, was often worn. But the most noticeable change occurs in the dress of country folk and ordinary citizens. The men began to drop all forms of doublet, and take to the long coat, a suit of black grogram below the knees, a sash, and a walking-stick. For the cold, a short black cloak. In the country the change would be very noticeable. The country town, the countryside was, until a few years back, distinctly puritanical in garb. There were Elizabethan doublets on old men, and wide Cromwellian breeches, patched, doubtless, walked the market-place hair was worn short. Now the russet brown clothes take a decided character in the direction of the Persian coat, and knickerbockers closed at the knee. The good wife of the farmer knots a loose cloth over her head, and pops a broad-brimmed man's hat over it. She has the sleeves of her dress made with turned-back cuffs, like her husband's, ties her shoes with strings, laces her dress in front, so as to show a bright-coloured underbodice, and, as like as not, wears a green pinner, an apron with a bib, which was pinned on to the dress, and altogether brings herself up to date. One might see the farmer's wife riding to market with her eggs in a basket, covered with a corner of her red cloak, and many a red cloak would she meet on the way, to clep with on the times and the fashions. The green apron was a mark of a Quaker in America, and the Society of Friends was not by any means sad in colour until late in their history. Most notable was the neckcloth in this unhappy reign, 
which went by the name of Judge Jeffrey's hempen cravat. End of section 31. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org in July 2010 in San Diego, California. Section 32 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. English Costume by Dion Clayton Calthrop. Section 32. William and Mary. Reigned thirteen years, 1689 to 1702. The King, born in 1650. The Queen, born in 1662. Married in 1677. The Men. First and foremost, the wig. Periwig, peruke, campaign wig with pole locks or dildos, all the rage, all the thought of the first gentleman. Their heads loaded with curl upon curl, long ringlets hanging over their shoulders and down their backs, some brown, some covered with meal until their coats looked like miller's coats, scented hair almost hiding the loose-tied cravat, most agreeably discoloured with snuff from top to bottom. My fine gentleman walking the street with the square-cut coat, open to show a fine waistcoat, his stick hanging by a ribbon on to his wrist and rattling on the pavement as it dragged along, his hat carefully perched on his wig, the crown made wide and high to hold the two wings of curls, which formed a negligent central parting. His pockets, low down in his coat, show a lace kerchief half dropping from one of them. One hand is in a small muff, the other holds a fine silver gilt box filled with Vigo snuff. He wears high-heeled shoes, red-heeled, perhaps, and the tongue of his shoe sticks up well above the instep. Probably he is on his way to the theatre, where he will comb his periwig in public and puff away the clouds of powder that come from it. The fair lady in a side-box, who hides her face behind a mask, is delighted if Sir Beau will bow to her. We are now among most precise people. One must walk here with just such an air of artificiality as will account one a fellow of high tone. The more enormous is our wig, the more frequently we take a pinch of violet Strasbourg, or best Brazil, orangery, bergamot, or jessamena, the more shall we be followed by persons anxious to learn the fashion. We may even draw a little silver bowl from our pocket, place it on a seat by us, and, in meditative mood, spit therein. We have gone completely into skirted coats and big flapped waistcoats. We have adopted the big cuff buttoned back. We have given up altogether the wide knee breeches, and wear only breeches not tight to the leg, but just full enough for comfort. The hats have altered considerably now. They are cocked up at all angles, turned off the forehead, turned up one side, turned up all round. Some are fringed with gold or silver lace. Others are crowned with feathers. We hear of such a number of claret-coloured suits that we must imagine that colour to be all the rage, and, in contrast to other times not long gone by, we must stiffen ourselves in buckram-lined skirts. These powdered Absaloms could change themselves into very fine fighting creatures, and look twice as sober again when occasion demanded. They rode about the country in periwigs, certainly, but not quite so bushy and curled. Many of them took to the travelling or campaign wig with the dildos or pole locks. These wigs were full over the ears and at the sides of the forehead, but they were low in the crown, and the two front ends were twisted into single pipes of hair, or the pipes of hair at the side were entirely removed, and one single pipe hung down the back. The custom of thus twisting the hair at the back, and there holding it with a ribbon, gave rise to the later pigtail. The periwigs so altered were known as short bobs, the bob being the fullness of the hair by the cheeks of the wig. 
The cuffs of the coat sleeve varied to the idea and taste of the owner of the coat. Sometimes the sleeve was widened at the elbow to eighteen inches, and the cuffs, turned back to meet the sleeves, were wider still. Two, three, or even more buttons held the cuff back. The pockets on the coats were cut vertically and horizontally, and these also might be buttoned up. Often the coat was held by only two center buttons, and the waistcoat flaps were not buttoned at all. The men's and women's muffs were small, and often tied and slung with ribbons. Plain round riding coats were worn, fastened by a clasp or a couple of large buttons. The habit of tying the neckcloth in a bow with full hanging ends was dying out, and a more loosely tied cravat was being worn. This was finished with fine lace ends, and was frequently worn quite long. Stockings were pulled over the knee, and were gartered below and rolled above it. The ordinary citizen wore a modified edition of these clothes, plain in cut, full, without half the number of buttons, and without the tremendous periwig, wearing merely his own hair long. For convenience in riding, the skirts of the coats were slit up the back to the waist. This slit could be buttoned up if need be. Now let us give the dandy of this time his pipe, and let him go in peace. Let us watch him stroll down the street, planting his high heels carefully, to join two companions outside the tobacco shop. Here, by the great carved wood figure of a smoking Indian with his kilt of tobacco leaves, he meets his fellows. From the hoop hung by the door one chooses a pipe, another asks for a quid to chew and a spittoon, the third calls for a paper of snuff newly rasped. Then they pull aside the curtains and go into the room behind the shop, where, seated at a table made of planks upon barrels, they will discuss the merits of smoking, chewing, and snuffing. We three are engaged in one cause. I snuffs, I smokes, and I chaws. THE WOMEN Let me picture for you a lady of this time in the language of those learned in dress, and you will see how much it may benefit. We see her coming afar off, against the yew hedge her weeds shine for a moment. We see her figuretto gown well looped and puffed with the Montelahon. Her echelle is beautiful, and her pinner exquisitely worked. We can see her commode, her top-knot, and her fontage, for she wears no rayon. A silver pin holds her meurtrières, and the fashion suits better than did the crève-coeur. One hand holds her Saxon green muffle-tea, under one arm is her chapeau-bras. She is beautiful, she needs no plumpers, and she regards us kindly with her watchet eyes. A lady of this date would read this and enjoy it, just as a lady of today would understand modern dress language, which is equally peculiar to the mere man. For example, this one of the Queen of Spain's hats from her trousseau, curiously enough a trousseau is a little bundle, the hat is a paille de talis, trimmed with a profusion of pink roses, accompanied by a pink chiffon ruffle fashioned into masses bouillonnet, arranged at intervals, and circled with wreaths of shaded roses. The modern terms, so vaguely used, are shocking, and the descriptive names given to colours by dress artists are horrible beyond belief, such as Watteau Pink and Elephant Grey, not to speak of Sèvres Blue Cherries. However, the female mind delights in such jargon and hotchpotch. Let me be kind enough to translate our William and Mary fashion language. Weeds is a term still in use in widow's weeds, meaning the entire dress appearance of a woman. A figuretto gown looped and puffed with the mon le haut is a gown of figured material gathered into loops over the petticoat and stiffened out with wires mon le haut. The echelle is a stomacher laced with ribbons in rungs like a ladder. Her pinner is her apron. The commode is the wire frame over which the curls are arranged, piled up in high masses over the forehead. The top knot is a large bow worn at the top of the commode, and the fontage, or tower, is a French arrangement of alternate layers of lace and ribbon raised one above another about half a yard high. 
It was invented in the time of Louis XIV, about 1680, by Mademoiselle Fontage. The rayon is a cloth hood pinned in a circle. The meurtrier, or murderers, are those twists in the hair which tie or unloose the arrangements of curls, and the creve coeur are the row of little forehead curls of the previous reign. A muffetee is a little muff, and a chapeau bras is a hat never worn, but made to be carried under the arm by men or women, for the men hated to disarrange their wigs. Plumpers were artificial arrangements for filling out the cheeks, and watchet eyes are blue eyes. The ladies have changed a good deal by the middle of this reign. They have looped up the gown till it makes side panniers and a bag-like droop at the back. The undergown has a long train, and the bodice is long-waisted. The front of the bodice is laced open, and shows either an arrangement of ribbon and lace, or a piece of the material of the undergown. Black pinners in silk with a deep frill are worn, as well as the white lace and linen ones. The ladies wear short black capes of this stuff with a deep frill. Sometimes, instead of the fontage, a lady wears a lace shawl over her head and shoulders, or a sort of lace cap bedizened with coloured ribbons. Her sleeves are like a man's, except that they come to the elbow only, showing a white undersleeve of lace gathered into a deep frill of lace, just below the elbow. She is very stiff and tight-laced, and very long in the waist, and at the waist, where the gown opens, and at the loopings of it, the richer wear jewelled brooches. Later in the reign there began a fashion for copying men's clothes, and ladies wore wide-skirted coats with deep-flapped pockets, the sleeves of the coats down below the elbow, and with deep-turned overcuffs. They wore, like the men, very much puffed, and ruffled linen and lace at the wrists. Also they wore men's waistcoat fashions, carried sticks and little arm hats, chapeau bras. To complete the dress, the hair was done in a bobwig style, and the cravat was tied round their necks and pinned. For the winter, one of those loose Dutch jackets, lined and edged with fur, having wide sleeves. The general tendency was to look Dutch, stiff, prim, but very prosperous, even the country maid in her best is close upon the heel of fashion with her laced bodice, sleeves with cuffs, apron, and high heeled shoes. End of section thirty two. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in March two thousand eleven, in San Diego, California. Section 33 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. English Costume by Dion Clayton Calthrop. Section 33. Queen Anne. Reigned twelve years, 1702 to 1714. Born 1665. Married, 1683, Prince George of Denmark. THE MEN AND WOMEN When I turn to the opening of the eighteenth century, and leave Dutch William and his Hollands and his pipe and his bulb gardens behind, it seems to me that there is a great noise, a tumultuous chattering. We seem to burst upon a date of talkers, of coffee-houses, of snuff and scandal. All this was going on before, I say to myself, people were wearing powdered wigs, and were taking snuff, and were talking scandal, but it did not appeal so forcibly. We arrive at sedan chairs, and hoops too big for them. We arrive at red-heeled shoes. Though both chairs and red heels belong to the previous reign, still we arrive at them now. They are very much in the picture." We seem to see a profusion, a confused mass of bobbins and bone lace, mourning hat bands, silk garters, amber canes correctly conducted, countrymen in red coats, coxcombs, brass and looking glass snuff boxes. Gentlemen walk past our mental vision with seals curiously fancied and exquisitely well cut. Ladies are sighing at the toss of a wig or the tap on a snuff box falling sick for a pair of striped garters, 
or a pair of fringed gloves. Gentlemen are sitting bald-headed in elegant dressing-gowns, while their wigs are being taken out of roulettes. The perruquier removes the neat, warm clay tube, gives a last pat to the fine pipes of the hair, and then gently places the wig on the waiting gentleman. If you can look through the walls of London houses, you will next see regiments of gentlemen, their faces pressed into glass cones, while the perruquier tosses powder over their newly put-on periwigs. The bow at the end of the long pigtail on the ramillies wig is tied. That is over. Running footmen, looking rather like Indians from the outsides of tobacco shops, speed past. They are dressed in close tunics with a fringed edge, which flicks them just above the knee. Their legs are tied up in leather guards, their feet are strongly shod, their wigs are in small bobs. On their heads are little round caps, with a feather stuck in them. In one hand they carry a long stick about five feet high, in the top knob of which they carry some food or a message. A message to whom? The running footman knocks on a certain door, and delivers to the pretty maid a note for her ladyship, from a handsome, well-shaped youth who frequents the coffee-houses about Charing Cross. There is no answer to the note. Her ladyship is too disturbed with household affairs. Her Welsh maid has left her under suspicious circumstances, and has carried off some articles. The lady is even now writing to Mr. Bickerstaff of the Tattler, to implore his aid. This is the list of the things she has missed, at least as much of the list as my mind remembers, as it travels back over the years. A thick wadded calico wrapper, a musk-coloured velvet mantle lined with squirrel skins, eight night shifts, four pairs of stockings curiously darned, six pairs of laced shoes, new and old, with the heels of half two inches higher than their fellows, a quilted petticoat of the largest size, and one of canvas, with whalebone hoops. Three pairs of stays, bolstered below the left shoulder. Two pairs of hips, of the newest fashion. Six roundabout aprons, with pockets, and four striped muslin night-rails, very little frayed. A silver cheese toaster, with three tongues. A silver posnet, to butter eggs. A Bible bound in shagreen, with gilt leaves and clasps, never opened but once. Two leather forehead clothes, three pair of oiled dogskin gloves. Two brand new plumpers, three pair of fashionable eyebrows. Adam and Eve in bugle work, without fig leaves, upon canvas, curiously wrought with her ladyship's own hand. Bracelets of braided hair, pomander, and seed pearl. A large old purple velvet purse, embroidered, and shutting with a spring, containing two pictures in miniature, the features visible. A silver gilt box for cashew and caraway comfits, to be taken at long sermons. A new gold repeating watch, made by a Frenchman. Together with a collection of receipts to make pastes for the hands, pomatums, lip salves, white pots, and water of talk. Of these things, one strikes the eye most curiously, the canvas petticoat with whalebone hoops. It dates the last, making me know that the good woman lost her things in or about the year 1710. We are just at the beginning of the era of the tremendous hoop skirt. This gentleman from the country will tell me all about it. I stop him and remark his clothes. By them I guess he has ridden from the country. He is wearing a wide-skirted coat of red, with deep flap pockets. His coat has buttons from neck to hem, but only two or three, at the waist, are buttoned. One hand, with the deep cuff pushed back from the wrist to show his neat frilled shirt, is thrust into his unbuttoned breeches pocket, the two pockets being across the top of his breeches. Round his neck is a black Steenkirk cravat, a black silk tie knotted and twisted, or allowed to hang loose. His hat is of black, and the wide brim is turned back from his forehead. His wig is a short black periwig in bobs, that is, it is gathered into bunches just on the shoulders, and is twisted in a little bob at the back of the neck. 
I have forgotten whether he wore red or blue stockings rolled above the knee, but either is likely. His shoes are strong, high-heeled, and have a big tongue showing above the buckle. He tells me that in Norfolk, where he has come from, the hoop has not come into fashion, that ladies there dress much as they did before Queen Anne came to the throne. The fontage is lower, perhaps, the waist may be longer, but skirts are full and have long trains, and are gathered in loops to show the petticoat of silk, with its deep double row of flounces. Aprons are worn long, and have good pockets. Cuffs are deep, but are lowered to below the elbow. The bodice of the gown is cut high in the back, and low in front, and is decked with a deep frill of lace or linen, which allows less bare neck to show than formerly. A very observant gentleman. "'But you have seen the new hoop?' I ask him. "'Yes, he has seen it. As he rode into town he noticed that the old fashions gave way to new, that every mile brought the fontage lower, and the hair more hidden, until short curls and a little cap of linen or lace entirely replaced the old high headdress and the profusion of curls on the shoulders.' The hoop, he noticed, became larger and larger as he neared the town, and the train grew shorter, and the patterns on the underskirt grew larger with the hoop. I leave my gentlemen from the country, and I stroll about the streets to regard the fashions. Here, I see, is a gentleman in one of the new Ramillies wigs, a wig of white hair drawn back from the forehead and puffed out full over the ears. At the back the wig is gathered into a long queue the plaited or twisted tail of a wig, and is ornamented at the top and bottom of the queue with a black bow. I notice that this gentleman is dressed in more easy fashion than some. His coat is not buttoned, the flaps of his waistcoat are not over big, his breeches are easy, his tie is loose. I know where this gentleman has stepped from. He has come straight out of a sampler of mine, by means of which piece of needlework I can get his story without book. I know that he has a tremendous periwig at home, covered with scented powder. I know that he has an elegant suit, with fullness of the skirts, at his sides gathered up to a button of silver gilt. There is plenty of lace on this coat, and deep bands of it on the cuffs. He has also, I am certain, a cane with an amber head, very curiously clouded, and this cane he hangs on to his fifth button by a blue silk ribbon. This cane is never used except to lift it up at a coachman, hold it over the head of a drawer, or point out the circumstances of a story. Also he has a single eyeglass, or perspective, which he will advance to his eye to gaze at a toast, or an orange wench. There is another figure on the sampler, a lady in one of those wide hoops. She has a fan in her hand. I know her as well as the gentleman, and know that she can use her fan as becomes a prude or a coquette. I know she takes her chocolate in bed at nine in the morning. At eleven she drinks a dish of bohi, tries a new head at her twelve o'clock toilette, and at two cheapens fans at the change. I have seen her at her mantua-maker's. I have watched her embroider a corner of her flower handkerchief, and give it up to sit before her glass to determine a patch. She is a good coachwoman, and puts her dainty laced shoe against the opposite seat to balance herself against the many jolts. Meanwhile she takes her mask off for a look at the passing world. If only I could ride in the coach with her! If only I could, I should see the fruit wenches in sprigged petticoats and flat broad-brimmed hats, the ballad sellers in tattered long-skirted coats, the country women in black hoods and cloaks, and the men in frieze coats. The ladies would pass by in pearl necklaces, flowered stomachers, artificial nosegays, and shaded furbelows. One is noted by her muff, one by her tippet, one by her fan. Here a gentleman bows to our coach, and my lady's heart beats to see his open waistcoat, his red heels, his suit of flowered satin. I should not fail to notice the monstrous petticoats worn by ladies in chairs or in coaches, these hoops stuffed out with cordage and stiffened with whalebone, and, according to Mr. Bickerstaff, making the women look like extinguishers, 
with a little knob at the upper end, and widening downward till it ends in a basis of most enormous circumference. To finish, I quite agree with Mr. Bickerstaff when he mentions the great shoe shop at the St. James end of Pall Mall, that the shoes there displayed, notably the slippers with green lace and blue heels, do create irregular thoughts in the youth of this nation. End of section 33, read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in July 2010 in San Diego, California. Section 34 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. English Costume by Dion Clayton Calthrop. Section 34. George the First. Reigned thirteen years, 1714 to 1727. Born 1660. Married 1682. Sophia of Brunswick. The Men and Women. We cannot do better than open Thackeray and put a finger on this passage. There is the lion's head, down whose jaws the spectator's own letters were passed, and over a great banker's in Fleet Street the effigy of the wallet, which the founder of the firm bore when he came into London a country boy. People this street, so ornamented with crowds of swinging chairmen, with servants bawling to clear the way, with Mr. Dean in his cassock, his lackey marching before him, or Mrs. Dinah in her sack, tripping to chapel, her footboy carrying her ladyship's great prayer-book, with itinerant tradesmen singing their hundred cries. I remember forty years ago, as a boy in London City, a score of cheery, familiar cries that are silent now. Fancy the bows thronging to the chocolate-houses, tapping their snuff-boxes as they issue thence, their periwig appearing over the red curtains. Fancy Saccharissa, beckoning and smiling from the upper windows, and a crowd of soldiers bawling and bustling at the door, gentlemen of the lifeguards, clad in scarlet with blue facings, and laced with gold at the seams, gentlemen of the horse-grenadiers, in their caps of sky-blue cloth, with the garter embroidered on the front in gold and silver, men of the halberdiers, in their long red coats, as bluff Harry left them, with their ruffs and velvet flat caps. Perhaps the King's Majesty himself is going to St. James as we pass. THE FOUR GEORGES We find ourselves, very willingly, discussing the shoes of the King of France with a crowd of powdered bows, those shoes the dandyism of which has never been surpassed, the heels, if you please, painted by van der Meulen with scenes from Rhenish victories or we go to the toy-shops in Fleet Street, where we may make assignations or buy us a mask, where loaded dice are slyly handed over the counter. Everywhere the bow. He rides the world like a cock-horse, or like Og the giant rode the Ark of Noah, steering it with his feet, getting his washing for nothing, and his meals passed up to him out by the chimney. Here is the old soldier begging in his tattered coat of red, here is a suspicious-looking character, with a black patch over his eye. Here the whalebone hoop of a petticoat takes up the way, and above the monstrous hoop is the tight bodice, and out of that comes the shoulders, supporting the radiant molly, patches, powder, paint, and smiles. Here a woman passes in a Nithsdale hood, covering her from head to foot, this great cloak with a piquant history of prison-breaking. Here, with a clatter of red high heels, the bow, the everlasting bow, in gold lace, wide cuffs, full skirts, swinging cane. A scene of flashing colours. The coats embroidered with flowers and butterflies, the cuffs a mass of fine sewing, the three-cornered hats cocked at a jaunty angle, the stockings rolled above the knee. Wigs in divisions of loops at the back pass by, Wigs in long queues, wigs in back and side bobs, lacquer hilted swords, paste buckles, gold and silver snuff boxes flashing in the sun, which struggles through the mass of swinging signs. 
there is a curious sameness about the clean-shaven faces surmounted by white wigs. There is, if we believe the pictures, a tendency to fat due to the tight waist of the breeches or the buckling of the belts. The ladies wear little lace and linen caps, their hair escaping in a ringlet or so at the side, and flowing down behind, or gathered close up to a small knob on the head. The gentlemen's coats fall in full folds on either side. The back, at present, has not begun to stick out so heavily with buckram. Aprons for ladies are still worn. Silks and satins, brocades and fine cloths, white wigs powdering velvet shoulders, crowds of cutthroats, elegant gentlemen, patched aspasias, tavern-swindlers, foreign adventurers, thieves, a highwayman, a footpad, a poor poet, and narrow streets and mud. Everywhere we see the skirted coat, the big flapped waistcoat. Even beggar boys, little pot-high urchins, are wearing some old laced waistcoat tied with string about their middles. A pair of heel-trodden, buckleless shoes on their feet, more likely barefooted. Here is a man snatched from the tripe shop in Hanging Sword Alley by the king's men, a pickpocket, a highwayman, a cutthroat in hiding. He will repent his jokes on Jack Ketch's kitchen when he feels the lash of the whip on his naked shoulders as he screams behind the cart-tail. Ladies in flowered hoops will stop to look at him. Bows will lift their quizzing glasses. A young girl will whisper behind a fan, painted with the loves of Jove, to a gorgeous young fop in a light-buttoned coat of sky-blue. There is a sadder sight to come. A cart on the way to Tyburn, a poor fellow standing by his coffin with a nosegay in his breast. He is full of Dutch courage, for, as becomes a notorious highwayman, he must show game before the crowd, so he is full of stum and Yorkshire stingo. Maybe we stop to see a pirate hanging in chains by the river, and we are jostled by horse officers and watermen, revenue men and jerkers, and, as usual, the curious bow, his glass to his eye. Never was such a time for curiosity. A man is preaching mystic religion. There is a new flavor to the rainbow tavern firmity. There is a fellow who can sew with his toes. A man is in the pillory for publishing Jacobite ballads, and always there is the beau looking on. Country ladies, still in small hoops, even in full dresses innocent of whalebone, are bewildered by the noise. Country gentlemen in plain-coloured coats and stout shoes have come to London on South Sea bubble business. They will go to the fair to see the harlequin and scaramouche dance. They will buy a new perfume at the civet cat, and they will go home. The lady's head full of the new hoop fashion, and she will cut away the sleeve of her old dress and put in fresh lace. The gentleman full of curses on tavern bills and the outrageous price of South Sea shares. And what, says country dame, to country dame lately from town, what is the mode in gentleman's hair? Her own good man has an old periwig, very full, and a small bob for ordinary wear. The very full periwig is going out, our lady assures her. A tied wig is quite the mode, a wig in three queues tied in round bobs, or in hair loops, and the long single queue wig is coming in rapidly, and will soon be all the wear. So, with talk of flowered tabbies and fine lute-string, are the fashions passed on. Just as Sir Roger de Coverley nearly called a young lady in riding-dress, Sir, because of the upper half of her body, so the ladies of this day might well be taken for Sirs, with their double-breasted riding-coats like the men, and their hair in a queue surmounted by a cocked hat. Colours and combinations of colours are very striking. Petticoats of black satin covered with large bunches of worked flowers. Morning gown of yellow flowered satin faced with cherry-coloured bands. Waistcoats of one colour with a fringe of another. Bird's-eye hoods, bodices covered with gold lace and embroidered flowers. All these gave a gay, artificial appearance to the age, but we are to become still more quaintly devised, still more powdered and patched, in the next reign. End of section 34, read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, 
in August 2010 in San Diego, California. Section 35 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. English Costume by Dion Clayton Calthrop. Section 35. George the Second. Reigned 33 years, 1727 to 1760. Born 1683. Married, 1705, Caroline of Ansbach. THE MEN Just a few names of wigs, and you will see how the periwig has gone into the background, how the bobwig has superseded the campaign wig. You will find a veritable confusion of barber's enthusiasms, half-forgotten designs, names dependent on a twist, a lock, a careful disarrangement pigeon's wing wigs with wings of hair at the sides, comets with long tails, full tails, cauliflowers with a profusion of curls, royal bind wigs, staircase wigs, ladders, brushes, count sacks wigs, cut bobs, long bobs, negligence, chain buckles, drop wigs, bags. Go and look at Hogarth. There's a world of dress for you by the grim humorist who painted Sarah Malcolm, the murderess, in her cell, who painted Taste in High Life. Wigs, inexhaustible subject, wigs passing from father to son, until they arrived at the second-hand dealers in Monmouth Street, and there, after a rough overhauling, began a new life. There was a wig lottery at sixpence a ticket in Rosemary Lane, and with even ordinary wigs, Grizzle majors at twenty-five shillings, great ties at a guinea, and brown bagwigs at fifteen shillings, quite a considerable saving might be made by the lucky lottery winner. On wigs, hats cocked to suit the passing fashion, broad-brimmed, narrow-brimmed, round, three-cornered, high-brimmed, low-brimmed, turned high off the forehead, turned low in front and high at the back, an endless crowd— such a day for clothes, for patches and politics, Tory side and whig to your face, Tory or whig cock to your hat, pockets high, pockets low, stiff cuffs, crushable cuffs, a regular jumble of go-as-you-please. Let me try to sort the jumble. Foremost, the coat. The coat is growing more full, more spread. It becomes, on the bow, a great spreading, flaunting, skirted affair, just buttoned by a button or two at the waist. It is laced or embroidered all over. It is flowered or plain. The cuffs are huge. They will, of course, suit the fancy of the owner or the tailor. About 1745 they will get small. Some will get small. Then the fashions begin to run riot. By the cut of coat you may not know the date of it, then, when you pass it in the street. From 1745 there begins the same jumble as today, a hopeless thing to unravel. In the next reign, certainly, you may tell yourself, here is one of the new macaronis, but that will be all you will mark out of the crowd of fashions, one more remarkable, newer than the rest, but perhaps you have been in the country for a week, and a new mode has come in and is dying out. From coat let us look at waistcoat. Full flaps and long almost to the knees, but again, about 1756, they will be shorter. They are fringed, flowered, laced, open to show the lace cravat fall so daintily, to show the black velvet bow tie that comes over from the black velvet, or silk, or satin tie of the queue. Ruffles of lace, of all qualities, at the wrists, the bow's hand emerging with his snuff-box from a filmy froth of white lace. In this era of costume, from George I to George IV, the great thing to remember is that the coat changes more than anything else. From the stiff William and Mary coat, with its deep, stiff cuffs, you see the change towards the George I coat, a looser cut, of the same design, still simple in embroideries. Then the coat skirts are gathered to a button at each side of the coat just behind the pockets. Then, in George II's reign, the skirt hangs in parallel folds, free from the button, and shapes to the back more closely. 
the opening of the coat, from the neck to the waist, being cut as to hang over the buttons and show the cravat and the waistcoat. Then, later in the same reign, we see the coat with the skirts free of buckram, and very full all round, and the cuffs also free of stiffening and folding with the crease of the elbow. Then, about 1745, we get the coat left more open, and, for the bow, cut much shorter, this often worn over a double-breasted waistcoat. Then, arriving at George the Third, we get a long series of coat changes, with a collar on it, turned over and standing high in the neck, with the skirts buttoned back, then cut away, then the front of the coat cut away like the modern dress coat. In following out these really complicated changes, I have done my best to make my meaning clear by placing dates against those drawings where dates are valuable, hoping by this means to show the rise and fall of certain fashions more clearly than any description would do. It will be noticed that, for ceremony, the periwig gave place to the tie-wig, or in some few cases to natural hair curled and powdered. The older men kept to the periwig, no doubt from fondness of the old and, as they thought, more grave fashion. But, as I showed at the beginning of the chapter, the beau and the young man, even the quite middle-class man, wore, or had the choice of wearing, endless varieties of false attires of hair. The sporting man had his own idea of dress, even as to-day he has a piquant idea in clothes, and who shall say he has not the right? A black wig, a jockey-cap with a bow at the back of it, a very resplendent morning-gown richly laced, a morning-cap, and very comfortable embroidered slippers, such mixtures of clothes in his wardrobe, his coat, no doubt, a little over-full, but of good cloth, his fine clothes rather over-embroidered, his tie-wig often pushed too far back on his forehead, and so showing his cropped hair underneath. Muffs must be remembered, as every dandy carried a muff in winter, some big, others grotesquely small. Bath must be remembered, and the great Beau Nash in the famous pump-room. As Thackeray says, so say I. "'I should like to have seen the folly,' he says, meaning Nash, it was a splendid, embroidered, beruffled, snuff-boxed, red-heeled, impertinent folly, and knew how to make itself respected. I should like to have seen that noble old madcap Peterborough in his boots. He actually had the audacity to walk about Bath in boots, with his blue ribbon and stars, and a cabbage under each arm, and a chicken in his hand, which he had been cheapening for his dinner." It was the fashion to wear new clothes on the Queen's birthday, March 1st, and then the streets noted the loyal people who indulged their extravagance, or pushed a new fashion on that day. Do not forget that no hard and fast rules can be laid down. A man's a man, for all his tailor tells him he is a walking fashion plate. Those who liked short cuffs wore them. Those who did not care for solitaires did without. The height of a heel, the breadth of a buckle, the sweep of a skirt, all lay at the taste of the owner, merely would I have you remember the essentials. There was a deal of dressing up, the king, bless you, in a Turkish array at a mask, the day of the Corridon and Sylvia, mock shepherd, dainty shepherdess were here, my lord in silk loose coat with paste buttons, fringed waistcoat, little three-cornered hat under his arm, and a pastoral staff between his fingers, a crook covered with cherry and blue ribbons, and my lady in such a hoop of sprigged silk or some such stuff, the tiniest of straw hat on her head, high heels tapping the ground, all a shepherding. What? Cupids, I suppose, little Dresden loves, little comfit-box jokes, little spiteful remarks about the Germans. Come, let me doff my Kevin Huller hat with the gold fringe, bring my red heels together with a smart tap, bow with my hand on the third button of my coat, from which my stick dangles, and let me introduce the ladies. The Women I will introduce the fair, painted, powdered, patched, perfumed sex, though this would do for man or woman of the great world then, by some lines from the bath guide. 
Bring, O oh, bring thy essence pot, Amber, musk, and bergamot, Eau de Chypre, Eau de Luce, Sans Paray, and Citron Juice. In a bandbox is contained painted lawns and checkered shades, crepe that's worn by lovelorn maids, watered tabbies, flowered brocades, straw-built hats and bonnets green, catgut gauzes, tippets, ruffs, fans and hoods and feathered muffs, stomachers and Paris nets, earrings, necklaces, aigrettes, fringes, blouses, and mignonettes, fine vermilion for the cheek, velvet patches a la grecque. Come, but don't forget the gloves, which, with all the smiling loves, Venus caught young Cupid picking from the tender breast of chicken. Now I think it will be best to describe a lady of quality. In the first years of the reign she still wears the large hooped skirt, a circular whalebone arrangement started at the waist, and at intervals the hoops were placed so that the petticoats stood out all round like a bell. Over this the skirt hung stiff and solemn. The bodice was tight-laced, cut square in front where the neckerchief of linen or lace made the edge soft. The sleeves still retained the cuff covering the elbow, and the under-sleeve of linen, with lace frills, came halfway down the forearm, leaving bare arm and wrist to show. Over the skirt she would wear, as her taste held her, a long plain apron, or a long tucked apron, or an apron to her knees. The bodice generally formed the top of a gown, which gown was very full-skirted, and was divided so as to hang back behind the dress, showing often very little in front. This will be seen clearly in the illustrations. The hair is very tightly gathered up behind, twisted into a small knob on the top of the head, and either drawn straight back from the forehead or parted in the middle, allowing a small fringe to hang on the temples. Nearly every woman wore a small cap or a small round straw hat with a ribbon round it. The ladies' shoes would be high-heeled and pointed-toed, with a little buckle and strap. About the middle of the reign the sack became the general town fashion, the sack being so named on account of the back, which fell from the shoulders into wide, loose folds over the hooped petticoat. The sack was gathered at the back in close pleats, which fell open over the skirt part of this dress. The front of the sack was sometimes open, sometimes made tight in the bodice. Now the lady would puff her hair at the sides and powder it. If she had no hair she wore false, and a little later a full wig. She would now often discard her neat cap and wear a veil behind her back, over her hair, and falling over her shoulders. In 1748, so they say, and so I believe to be true, the king, walking in the mall, saw the Duchess of Bedford riding in a blue riding habit with white silk facings. This would be a man's skirted coat, double-breasted, a cravat, a three-cornered hat, and a full blue skirt. He admired her dress so much, and thought it so neat, that he straightway ordered that the officers of the navy, who until now had worn scarlet, should take this coat for the model of their new uniform. So did the navy go into blue and white. The poorer classes were not, of course, dressed in hooped skirts, but the bodice and gown over the petticoat, the apron, and the turned-back cuff to the short sleeve were worn by all. The orange wench laced her gown neatly and wore a white cloth tied over her head. About her shoulders she wore a kerchief of white, and often a plain frill of linen at her elbows. There were blue canvas, striped dimity, flannel, and ticken for the humble. For the rich, lustrings, satins, padissois, velvets, damasks, fans, and leghorn hats, bands of Valenciennes and Pointe du Dunkirk, these might be bought of Mrs. Holt, whose card Hogarth engraved, at the two olive posts, in the broad part of the Strand. 1755 saw the one-horse chairs introduced from France, called cabriolets, the first of our own extraordinary wild-looking conveyances contrived for the minimum of comfort and the maximum of danger. This invention captivated the hearts of both men and women. The men painted cabriolets on their waistcoats, they embroidered them on their stockings, they cut them out in black silk and patched their cheeks with them, horse and all. The women began to take up, a little later, the cabriolet caps with round sides like linen wheels, and later still, at the very end of the reign, there began a craze for such headdresses, post-chaises, chairs and chairmen, even wagons, and this craze grew and grew, and hair grew, 
in wigs, to meet the cry for hair and straw men of war, for loads of hay, for birds of paradise, for goodness knows what forms of utter absurdity, all of which I put down to the introduction of the cab. I think that I can best describe the lady of this day as a swollen-skirted figure with a pinched waist, little head of hair, or tiny cap, developing into a loose, sack-backed figure still whale-boned out, with hair puffed at the sides and powdered, getting ready to develop again into a queer figure under a tower of hair, but that waits for the next reign. One cannot do better than go to Hogarth's prints and pictures, wonderful records of this time, one picture especially, Taste in High Life, being a fine record of the clothes of 1742. Here you will see the pannier and the sack, the monstrous muff, the huge hoop, the long-tailed wig, the black boy, and the monkey. In the noon of the four parts of the day, there are clothes again satirized. I am trusting that the drawings will supply what my words have failed to picture, and I again, for the twenty-first time, repeat that, given the cut and the idea of the time, the student has always to realize that there can be no hard and fast rule about the fashions. With the shape he can take liberties up to the points shown, with color he can do anything. Patterns of the materials are obtainable, and Hogarth will give anything required in detail. End of section 35, read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in March 2011, in San Diego, California. Section 36 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. English Costume by Dion Clayton Calthrop. Section 36. George the Third, reigned sixty years, 1760 to 1820. Born 1738. Married 1761. Charlotte Sophia of Mecklenburg Strelitz. The Men and Women. Throughout this long reign, the changes of costume are so frequent, so varied, and so jumbled together, that any precise account of them would be impossible. I have endeavoured to give a leading example of most kind of styles in the budget of drawings, which goes with this chapter. Details concerning this reign are so numerous. Fashion books, fashion articles in the London Magazine, the St. James Chronicle, works innumerable on hair-dressing, tailors' patterns, these are easily within the reach of those who hunt the second-hand shops, or are within reasonable distance of a library. Following my drawings you will see in the first the ordinary wig, skirted coat, knee-breeches, chapeau bras, cravat or waistcoat of the man about town. I do not mean of the exquisite about town, but, if you will take it kindly, just such clothes as you or I might have worn. In the second drawing we see a fashionable man who might have strutted past the first fellow in the park. His hair is dressed in a twisted roll. He wears a tight-brimmed little hat, a frogged coat, a fringed waistcoat, striped breeches, and buckled shoes. In the third we see the dress of a macaroni. On his absurd wig he wears a little never-noise hat. His cravat is tied in a bow, his breeches are loose, and be ribboned at the knee. Many of these macaronis wore coloured strings at the knee of their breeches, but the fashion died away when Jack Ran, sixteen-string Jack, as he was called after this fashion, had been hung in this make of breeches. In number four we see the development of the tail-coat and the high-buttoned waistcoat. The tail-coat is, of course, sun to the frock-coat, the skirts of which, being inconvenient for riding, had first been buttoned back, and then cut back, to give more play. In the fifth drawing we see the double-breasted cutaway coat. Number six is but a further tailcoat design. Number seven shows how different were the styles at one time. Indeed, except for the macaroni and other extreme fashions, the entire budget of men as shown might have formed a crowd in the park on one day about twenty years before the end of the reign. There would not be much powdered hair after 1795, but a few examples would remain. 
a distinct change is shown in the eighth drawing of the long-tailed full coat the broad hat the hair powdered but not tied number nine is another example of the same style the tenth drawing shows the kind of hat we associate with napoleon and in fact very napoleonic garments in eleven we have a distinct change in the appearance of english dress the gentleman is a zebra and is so called from his striped clothes he is of course in the extreme of fashion which did not last for long but it shows a tendency toward later georgian appearance the top hat the shorter hair the larger neckcloth the pantaloons forerunners of brummel's invention the open sleeve number twelve shows us an ordinary gentleman in a coat and waistcoat with square flaps called dog's ears as the drawings continue, you can see that the dress became more and more simple, more like modern evening dress as to the coats, more like modern stiff fashion about the neck. The drawings of the women's dresses should also speak for themselves. You may watch the growth of the wig and the decline of the hoop, I trust with ease. You may see those towers of hair of which there are so many stories, those masses of meal and stuffing, powder and pomatum, the dressing of which took many hours. Those piles of decorated, perfumed, reeking mess, by which a lady could show her fancy for the navy by balancing a straw ship on her head, for sport by showing a coach, for gardening by a regular bed of flowers. Heads which were only dressed perhaps once in three weeks, and were then re-scented because it was necessary. Monstrous germ-gatherers of horsehair, hemp-wool, and powder, laid on in a paste, the cleaning of which is too awful to give in full detail. Three weeks, says my lady's hairdresser, is as long as a head can go well in the summer, without being opened. Then we go on to the absurd idea which came over womankind, that it was most becoming to look like a powder pigeon. She took to a buffon, a gauze or fine linen kerchief, which stuck out pigeon-like in front, giving an exaggerated bosom to those who wore it. With this fashion of 1786 came the broad-brimmed hat. Travel a little further, and you have the mob-cap. All of a sudden, out go hoops, full skirts, high hair, powder, buffons, broad-brimmed hats, patches, high-heeled shoes, and in come willowy figures and thin, nearly transparent dresses, turbans, low shoes, straight fringes. I am going to give a chapter from a fashion book to show you how impossible it is to deal with the vagaries of fashion in the next reign, and if I chose to occupy the space, I could give a similar chapter to make the confusion of this reign more confounded. End of section 36. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in August 2010 in San Diego, California. Section 37 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kara Schallenberg. English Costume by Dion Clayton Calthrop. Section 37. George the Fourth. George the Fourth. Reigned ten years. 1820 to 1830. Born 1762. Married 1795. Caroline of Brunswick. Out of the many fashion books of this time I have chosen, from a little brown book in front of me, a description of the fashions for ladies during one part of 1827. It will serve to show how mere man, blundering on the many complexities of the feminine passion for dress, I was going to say clothes, may find himself left amid a froth of frills, high and dry, except for a whiff of spray, standing in his unromantic garments, on the shore of the great world of gauze and gussets, while the most noodle-headed girl sails gracefully away upon the high seas to pirate some new device of the devil or Paris. Our wives, bless them, 
occasionally treat us to a few bewildering terms, hoping by their gossamer knowledge to present to our gaze a mental picture of a new, adorable, ardently desired hat. Perhaps those nine proverbial tailors, who go to make the one proverbial man, least of his sex, might, by a strenuous effort, confine the history of clothes during this reign into a compact literature of forty volumes. It would be indecent, as undecorous as the advertisements in ladies' papers, to attempt to fathom the language of the man who endeavoured to read the monumental effigy to the vanity of human desire for adornment. But is it adornment? Nowadays, to be dressed well is not always the same thing as to be well dressed. Often it is far from it. The question of modern clothes is one of great perplexity. It seems that what is beauty one year may be the abomination of desolation the next, because the trick of that beauty has become common property. You puff your hair at the sides, you are in the true sanctum of the mode. You puff your hair at the sides, you are for ever utterly cast out as one having no understanding. I shall not attempt to explain it. It passes beyond the realms of explanation into the pure air of truth. The truth is simple. Aristocracy being no longer real, but only a cult, one is afraid of one's servants. Your servant puffs her hair at the sides, and, hang it, she becomes exactly like an aristocrat. Our servant, having dropped her G's for many years, as well as her H's, it behooved us to pronounce our G's and our H's. Our servants, having learned our English, it became necessary for us to drop our G's. We seem at present unwilling in the matter of the H, but that will come. To cut the cackle and come to the clothes horse, let me say that the bunglement of clothes which passes all comprehension in King George the Fourth's reign is best explained by my cuttings from the book of one who apparently knew. Let the older writer have his, or her, fling in his, or her, words. Currency Remarks on the Last New Fashions the city of London is now indeed most splendid in its buildings and extent. London is carried into the country, but never was it more deserted. A very, very few years ago, and during the summer, the dresses of the wives and daughters of our opulent tradesmen would furnish subjects for the investigators of fashion. Now, if those who chance to remain in London take a day's excursion of about eight or ten miles' distance from the metropolis, they hear the innkeepers deprecating the steamboats, by which they declare they are almost ruined. On Sundays, which would sometimes bring them the clear profits of ten or twenty pounds, they now scarce produce ten shillings. No, those of the middle class belonging to Cockney Island must leave town, though the days are short, and even getting cold and comfortless the steamboats carrying them off by shoals to Margate and its vicinity. The pursuit after elegant and superior modes of dress must carry us farther. It is now from the rural retirement of the country seats belonging to the noble and wealthy that we must collect them. Young ladies wear their hair well arranged, but not quite with the simplicity that prevailed last month. During the warmth of the summer months, the braids across the forehead were certainly the best, but now, when neither in fear of heat or damp, the curls again appear in numerous clusters round the face, and some young ladies, who seem to place their chief pride in a fine head of hair, have such a multitude of small ringlets that give to what is a natural charm all the poodle-like appearance of a wig. The bows of hair are elevated on the summit of the head, and confined by a comb of tortoise-shell. Caps of the cornet kind are much in fashion, made of blonde, and ornamented with flowers or puffs of coloured gauze. Most of the cornets are small, and tie under the chin, with a bow on one side of white satin ribbon. 
those which have ribbons or gauze lappets floating loose, have them much shorter than formerly. A few dress hats have been seen at dinner parties and musical amateur meetings in the country, of transparent white crepe, ornamented with a small, elegant bouquet of marabones. When these dress hats are of coloured crepe, they are generally ornamented with flowers of the same tint as the hat, in preference to feathers. Printed muslins and chintzes are still very much worn in the morning walks, with handsome sashes, having three ends depending down each side, not much beyond the hips. With one of these dresses we saw a young lady wear a rich black satin pelerine, handsomely trimmed, with a very beautiful black blonde. It had a very neat effect, as the dress was light. White muslin dresses, though they are always worn partially in the country till the winter actually commences, are now seldom seen except on the young. The embroidery on these dresses is exquisite. Dresses of Indian red, either in taffety or chintz, have already made their appearance, and are expected to be much in favour the ensuing winter. The chintzes have much black in their patterns, but this light material will, in course, be soon laid aside for silks, and these, like the taffeties which have partially appeared, will no doubt be plain. With these dresses was worn a canazon spencer, with long sleeves of white muslin, trimmed with narrow lace. Gros de Naples dresses are very general, especially for receiving dinner parties, and for friendly evening society. At private dances, the only kind of ball that has at present taken place, are worn dresses of the white-figured gauze over white satin or gros de Naples. At the theatricals sometimes performed by noble amateurs, the younger part of the audience, who do not take a part, are generally attired in very clear muslin, over white satin, with drapery scarves of lace, barege, or thick embroidered tulle. Cashmere shawls, with a white ground and a pattern of coloured flowers or green foliage, are now much worn in outdoor costumes, especially for the morning walk. The mornings being rather chilly, these warm envelopes are almost indispensable. We are sorry, however, to find our modern bells so tardy in adopting those coverings, which ought now to succeed to the light appendages of summer costume. The muslin canazon spencer, the silk fichu, and even the lighter barege, are frequently the sole additions to a high dress, or even to one but partially so. We have lately seen, finished to the order of a lady of rank in the county of Suffolk, a very beautiful pelisse of jonquil-coloured gros de Naples. It fastens close down from the throat to the feet in front with large covered buttons. At a suitable distance on each side of this fastening are three bias folds, rather narrow, brought close together under the belt, and enlarging as they descend to the border of the skirt. A large pelerine cape is made to take on and off, and the bust from the back of each shoulder is ornamented with the same bias folds, forming a stomacher in front of the waist. The sleeves, a la Marie, are puckered a few inches above the wrist, and confined by three straps, each with a large button. Though long ends are very much in favour with silk pelerines, yet there are quite as many that are quite round, such was the black satin pelerine we cited above. Coloured bonnets are now all the rage. We are happy to say that some, though all too large, are in the charming cottage style, and are modestly tied under the chin. Some bonnets are so excessively large that they are obliged to be placed quite at the back of the head, and as their extensive brims will not support a veil, when they are ornamented with a broad blonde, the edge of that just falls over the hair, but does not even conceal the eyes. Leghorn hats are very general. Their trimmings consist chiefly of ribbons, though some ladies add a few branches of green foliage between the bows or puffs. These are chiefly of the fern, a great improvement to these green branches is the having a few wild roses intermingled. The most admired colours are lavender, esterhazy, olive green, lilac, marshmallow blossom, and Indian red. At rural fates the ornaments of the hats generally consist of flowers. 
these hats are backward in the Arcadian fashion, and discover a wreath of small flowers on the hair. Ex bandeau. In Paris, the most admired colors are ethereal blue, hortensia, camelopard yellow, pink, grass green, jonquil, and parma violet. September 1, 1827. Really, this little fashion book is very charming. It recreates for me the elegant, simpering ladies. It gives in its style just that artificial note which conjures this age of ladies with hats, in the charming cottage style, modestly tied under the chin. They had the complete art of languor, these dear creatures. They lisped Italian, and were fine needlewomen. They painted weak little landscapes. Nooks or arbours found them dreaming of a Gothic revival. They were all this and more, but through this sweet envelope the delicate refined souls shone. They were true women, often great women. Their loops of hair, their camelopard pelerines, shall not rob them of immortality, cannot destroy their softening influence, which permeated even the outrageous dandyism of the men of their time, and steered the three-bottle gentlemen, their husbands, and our grandfathers, into a grand old age which we reverence to-day and wonder at, seeing them as giants against our nerve-shattered, drug-taking generation. As for the men, look at the innumerable pictures, and collect, for instance, the material for a colossal work upon the stock ties of the time. Run your list of varieties into some semblance of order. Commence with the varieties of Macassar brown stocks. Pass on to patent leather stocks. Take your man for a walk, and cause him to pass a window full of Hibernian stocks. Let him discourse on the stocks worn by turf enthusiasts, and, when you are approaching the end of your twenty-third volume, give a picture of a country dinner-party, and end your work with a description of the gentlemen under the table being relieved of their stocks by the faithful family butler. End of section 37. Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org in November 2010 in San Diego, California. Section 38 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. English Costume by Dion Clayton Calthrop. Section 38. Powder and Patches. The affectation of a mole to set off their beauty such as Venus had. At the devil's shops you buy a dress of powdered hair. From the splendid pageant of history what figures come to you most willingly? Does a great procession go by the window of your mind? Knights bronzed by the son of Palestine, kings in chains, emperors in blood-drenched purple, poets clothed like grocers with the souls of angels shining through their eyes, fussy secretaries of state, informers, spies, inquisitors, court cards come to life, harlequins, statesmen in great ruffs, wives of Bath in foot-mantles and white wimples, sulky Puritans, laughing cavaliers, Dutchmen drinking gin and talking politics. Men in wide-skirted coats and huge black periwigs, all walking, riding, being carried in coaches, in sedan-chairs, over the face of England. Every step of the procession yields wonderful dreams of colour. In every group there is one who, by the personality of his clothes, can claim the name of Beau. Near the tail of the throng there is a chattering, bowing, rustling crowd, dimmed by a white mist of scented hair-powder. They are headed, I think, for one cannot see too clearly, by the cook of the Comte de Bellemer, a man by name Le Gros, the great hairdresser. Under his arm is a book, the title of which reads, Art de la Coiffure des Dames Françaises. Behind him is a lady in an enormous hoop. Her hair is dressed à la belle poule. She is arguing some minute point of the disposition of patches with Monsieur Léonard, another artist in hair. "'What will be the next wear?' she asks. "'A heart near the eye? La assassine, eh? 
or a star near the lips, la fripon? Must I wear a galant on my cheek, an enjoué in my dimple, or la majestuse on my forehead? Before we can hear the reply, another voice is raised, a guttural German voice. It is John Schnorr, the iron master of Erzgebinge. The feet stuck in it, I tell you, he says, actually stuck. I got from my saddle and looked at the ground. My horse had carried me on to what proved to be a mine of wealth. Hair powder! I sold it in Dresden, in Leipzig, and then at Meissen. What does butcher do but use my hair powder to make white porcelain? And so the chatter goes on. Here is Charles Fox tapping the ground with his red heels, and proclaiming, in a voice thick with wine, on the merits of blue hair powder. Here is Brummel, free from hair powder, free from the obnoxious necessity of going with his regiment to Manchester. The dressy person and the person who is well dressed, these two showing everywhere. The one is in a screaming hue of woad, the other a quiet note of blue dye. The one in excessive velvet sleeves that he cannot manage, the other controlling a rich amplitude of material with perfect grace. Here a lyra pipe is extravagantly long. Here a gold circlet decorates curled locks with matchless taste. Everywhere the battle between taste and gaudiness. High hennins, steeples of millinery, stick up out of the crowd. Below these, the towers of powdered hair bow and sway as the fine ladies patter along. What a rustle and a bustle of silks and satins, of flowered tabbies, rich brocades, cut velvets, superfine cloths, woolens, cloth of gold. See, there are the square-shouldered Tudors, there are the steel glints of Plantagenet armour, the eastern-robed followers of Coeur de Leon, the swaggering beribboned royalists, the ruffs, trunks, and doublets of Elizabethans, the snuffy, wide-skirted coats swaying about Queen Anne. There are the soft-swathed Norman ladies with bound-up chins, the tapestry figures of ladies proclaiming Agincourt, the dignified dames about Elizabeth of York, the playmates of Catherine Howard, the wheels of round farthingales, and the high lace collars of King James Court, the beauties bare-breasted of Lely, the Hogarthian women in close caps. And in front of us two posturing figures in Dresden china colours, rouged, patched, powdered, perfumed, in hoop skirts, flirting with a fan, the lady, in gold-laced wide coat, solitaire, bagwig, ruffles, and red heels, the gentleman. I protest, madame, he is saying, but you flatter me vastly. La, sir, she replies, I am prodigiously truthful. And how are we to know that all this is true, the critics ask, guarding the interest of the public? We see that your book is full of statements, and there are no or few authorities given for your studies. Where, they ask, are the venerable anecdotes which are given a place in every respectable work on your subject? To appease the appetites which are always hungry for skeletons, I give a short list of those books which have proved most useful. Manuscript Cotton, Claudius, B. 4. Manuscript Harl, 603, Psalter, English, 11th century. The Bio Tapestry. Manuscript Cotton, Tiberius, C. 6. Psalter. Manuscript Trinity College, Cambridge, R. 17. 1. Illustrated by Edwin, a monk, 1130 to 1174. Manuscript Harl, Roll, Y. 6. Manuscript Harl, 5102. Stothard's Monumental Effigies. Manuscript C. 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 Cambridge, 16. Manuscript Cot. Nero, D. 1. Manuscript Cot. Nero, C. 4. Full of drawings. Manuscript Roy, 14. C. 7. Lansdowne Manuscript, British Museum. Macklin's Monumental Brasses. 
Journal of the Archaeological Association Manuscript Roy 2 B 7 Manuscript Roy 10 E 4 Good marginal drawings The Luttrell Psalter Invaluable for costume Manuscript Bodleian Miscellaneous 264 1338 to 1344 Very full of useful drawings Dr. Furnival's edition of the Ellesmere Manuscript of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Boutel's Monumental Brasses. Manuscript Harl, 1819. Metrical History of the Close of Richard II's Reign. Good Drawings for Costume. Manuscript Harl, 1892. Manuscript Harl, 2278. Lydgate's Life of St. Edmund. Manuscript Roy, 15, E, 6. Fine miniatures. The Bedford Missal, Manuscript, Add, 18850. Manuscript Harl, 2982. A Book of Hours, Many Good Drawings. Manuscript Harl, 4425. The Romance of the Rose, Fine and Useful Drawings. Manuscript Lambeth, 265. Manuscript Roy, 19, C, 8. Manuscript Roy, 16, F, 2. Turberville's Book of Falconry and Book of Hunting. Shaw's Dresses and Decorations. Jusserand's English Novel and Wayfaring Life. Very excellent books, full of reproductions from illuminated books, prints, and pictures. The Shepherd's Calendar, 1579, British Museum. Harding's Historical Portraits Nichols' Progresses of Queen Elizabeth Stubbs' Anatomy of Abuses, 1583 Brown's Civitates Orbis Terrarum Vestusta Monumenta Holler's Ornatus Muliebris Anglicanus Holler's Aula Veneris Pepys' Diary Evelyn's Diary Tempest's Cries of London, 50 plates. Atkinson's Costumes of Great Britain. In addition to these, there are, of course, many other books, prints, engravings, sets of pictures, and heaps of caricatures. The excellent labors of the Society of Antiquaries and the Archaeological Association have helped me enormously. These, with wills, wardrobe accounts, satires by Hall and others, anatomies of abuses, broadsides, and other works on the same subject, French, German, and English, have made my task easier than it might have been. It was no use to spin out my list of manuscripts with the numbers, endless numbers, of those which proved dry ground, so I have given those only which have yielded a rich harvest. End of section 38 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in November 2010, in San Diego, California. Section 39 of English Costume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. English Costume by Dion Clayton Cowthrop, Section 39 Beau Brummel and Clothes A person, my dear, who will probably come and speak to us, and if he enters into conversation, be careful to give him a favorable impression of you, for, and she sunk her voice to a whisper, he is the celebrated Mr. Brummel. Life of Beau Brummel, Captain Jesse those who care to make the melancholy pilgrimage may see, in the Protestant cemetery at Cain, the tomb of George Bryan Brummel. He died at the age of sixty-two, in 1840. It is indeed a melancholy pilgrimage to view the tomb of that once resplendent figure, to think, before the hideous grave, of the witty, clever, foolish procession from Eton to Oriel College, Oxford, from thence 
to a captaincy in the tenth hussars from number four chesterfield street to number thirteen chapel street park lane from chapel street a flight to calais from calais to paris and then at last to cane and the bitter bitter end mumbling and mad to die in the bon savoir place him beside the man who once pretended to be his friend the man of whom thackeray spoke so truly but a bow and a grin i try and take him to pieces and find silk stockings padding stays a coat with frogs and a fur coat a star and a blue ribbon a pocket handkerchief prodigiously scented one of truefit's best nutty brown wigs reeking with oil a set of teeth and a huge black stock under waistcoats and more under waistcoats and then nothing nothing thackeray is right absolutely nothing remains of this king george of ours but a sale list of his wardrobe a wardrobe which fetched fifteen thousand pounds second hand a wardrobe that had been a man he invented a shoe buckle one inch long and five inches broad he wore a pink silk coat with white cuffs he had five thousand steel beads on his hat he was a coward a good-natured contemptible voluptuary beside him in our eyes walks for a time the elegant figure of beau brummel i have said that brummel was the inventor of modern dress it is true he was the beau who raised the level of dress from the slovenly dirty linen the greasy hair the filthy neckcloth the crumbled collar to a position ever since held by englishmen of quiet unobtrusive cleanliness decent linen and abhorrence of striking forms of dress he made clean linen and washing daily a part of english life see him seated before his dressing-glass a mahogany-framed sliding cheval glass with brass arms on either sides for candles by his side is george four recovering from his drunken bout of last night the beau's glass reflects his clean complexioned face his gray eyes his light brown hair and sandy whiskers a servant produces a shirt with a twelve-inch collar fixed to it assists the bow into it arranges it and stands aside the collar nearly hides the bow's face now with his hand protected with a discarded shirt he folds his collar down to the required height now he takes his white stock and folds it carefully round the collar the stock is a foot high and slightly starched a supreme moment of artistic decision and the stock and collar take their perfect creases in an hour or so he will be ready to partake of a light meal with the royal gentleman he will stand up and survey himself in his morning dress his regular quiet suit a blue coat light breeches fitting the leg well a light waistcoat over a waistcoat of some other color never a startling contrast hessian boots or top boots and buckskins there was nothing very peculiar about his clothes except as lord byron said an exquisite propriety his evening dress was a blue coat white waistcoat black trousers buttoned at the ankle these were of his own invention and one may say it was the wearing of them that made trousers more popular than knee breeches striped silk stockings and a white stock he was a man of perfect taste of fastidious taste on his tables lay books of all kinds in fine covers who would suspect it but the prince is leaning an arm on a copy of ellis's early english metrical romances the beau is a rhymer an elegant verse maker here we see the paper presser of napoleon i am flitting for the moment over some years and see him in his room in calais here we notice his passion for boule his sevres china painted with court beauties in his house in chapel street he saw daily portraits of nelson and pitt and george third upon his walls there is no beau as we understand the term for we make it a word of contempt a nickname for a feeble fellow in magnificent garments 
Rather, this is the room of an educated gentleman of exquisite propriety. He played high, as did most gentlemen. He was superstitious, as are many of the best of men. That lucky sixpence, with a hole in it, that you gave to a cabman, Beau Brummel, was that loss the commencement of your downward career? There are hundreds of anecdotes of Brummel, which, despite those of the George Ring the Bell character, and those told of his heavy gaming are more valuable as showing his wit, his cleanliness, his distaste of display, in fact, his exquisite propriety. A beau is hardly a possible figure today. We have so few personalities, and those we have are chiefly concerned with trade, men who uphold trusts, men who fight trusts, men who speak for trade in the House of Commons. We have not the same large vulgarities as our grandfathers, nor have we the same wholesome refinement. In killing the evil, the great gambler, the great men of the turf, the great prize-fighters, the heavy wine-drinkers, we have killed, also, the good, the classic, well-spoken civil gentlemen. Our manners have suffered at the expense of our morals. Fifty or sixty years ago the world was full of great men, saying, writing, thinking great things. Today, perhaps it is too early to speak of today. Personalities are so little marked by their clothes, by any stamp of individuality, that the caricaturist, or even the minute and truthful artist, be he painter or writer, has a difficult task before him when he sets out to point at the men of these our times. George Brummel came into the world on June 7, 1778. He was a year or so late for the macaroni style of dress, many years behind the fribbles, after the smarts, and must have seen the rise and fall of the zebras when he was thirteen. During his life he saw the old-fashioned full frock coat, bagwig, solitaire, and ruffles die away. He saw the decline and fall of knee-breeches for common wear, and the pantaloons invented by himself take their place. From these pantaloons, reaching to the ankle, came the trousers, as fashionable garments, open over the instep at first, and joined by loops and buttons, then strapped under the boot, and after that in every manner of cut to the present style. He saw the three-corner hat vanish from the hat-boxes of the polite world, and he saw fine-colored clothes give way to blue coats with brass buttons or coats of solemn black. It may be said that England went into mourning over the French Revolution, and has not yet recovered. Beau Brummel, on his way to Eton, saw a gay-colored crowd of powdered and patched people, saw claret-colored coats covered with embroidery, gold-laced hats, twinkling shoe-buckles. On his last walks in Caen, no doubt, he dreamed of London as a place of gay colors instead of the drab place it was beginning to be. Today there is no more monotonous sight than the pavements of Piccadilly, crowded with people in dingy, sad clothes, with silk tubes on their heads, their black and gray suits being splashed by the mud from black hansoms, or by the scatterings of motor-cars, driven by aristocratic-looking mechanics, in which the mechanical-looking aristocrats lounge, darkly clad. Here and there some woman's dress enlivens the monotony. Here a red pillar-box shines in the sun. There, again, we bless the post-office for their red mail carts, and perhaps we are strengthened to bear the gloom by the sight of a blue or red bus. But our hearts are not in tune with the picture. We feel the lack of color, of romance, of everything but money in the street. Suddenly a magnificent policeman stops the traffic. There is a sound of jingling harness, of horses' hoofs beating in unison. There flashes upon us an escort of lifeguards sparkling in the sun, flashing specks of light from swords, breastplates, helmets. The little forest of waving plumes, the raising of hats, the polite murmuring of cheers warms us. We feel young. Our hearts beat. We feel more healthy, more alive, for this gleam of color. 
then an open carriage passes us swiftly as we stand with bared heads there is a momentary sight of a man in uniform a man with a wonderful face clever dignified kind and we say with a catch in our voices the king god bless him end of section thirty nine end of english costume by dion clayton calthrop